Hello and uh, welcome to this uh, Q&A se session. Today we are pleased uh, to receive uh, Professor Gemant, which is uh, a prominent figure in the field of uh, commodities. Uh, she is Professor of Finance at uh, Birbeck University of London, where she is Director of the Commodity uh, Finance Centre and Research Professor at the uh, John Hopkins uh, University. She is a graduate of uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure uh, in Mathematics and uh, she holds a Master Degree uh, in Theoretical Physics and a PhD in Probability for, from the University of uh, Pierre et Marie Curie and a PhD in finance from the University of uh, Panthéon-Sorbonne. In uh, 1993, she became a professor agrégé des universités uh, in management and juridical sciences. Uh, professor Gemant is a, is a well-known figure in the field of uh, commodities, uh, and uh, she has tremendous uh, amount of experience, uh, 20 years plus experience as the scientific advisor uh, for major uh, financial institutions, uh, major uh, commodity producers and uh, major commodity houses uh, uh, covering large uh, la large um, uh, amount of topics uh, from uh, from interest rates uh, uh, to risks uh, to agriculturals to minerals uh, electricity uh, and uh, prior to that she's been head of research uh, for the uh, Caisse des Dépôts in Paris uh, she's published uh, several books uh, to name a few uh, she uh, published uh, uh, a book uh, called Commodities and Commodity Derivatives, Energy, Metals and Agriculturals, uh, which was published by Willays in, uh, uh, in 2005, and uh, which serves as a reference uh, for many uh, professionals in the industry. Uh, she also edited in 2008 a book uh, uh, entitled Risk Management, Commodity Markets, uh, From Shipping to Agriculturals and Energy. And in 2015, she published a book entitled Agricultural Finance, From Crops to Land, Water and Infrastructure, uh, which is a comprehensive resource that enables deep understanding of the uh, major complexities of uh, agricultural finance. So, Professor, thank you very much for accepting our inv invitation. Uh, I'd like to start uh, this uh, interview today uh, with your book. Uh, could you tell us more about uh, your latest book, Agricultural Finance from Crops to Land, Water and Infrastructure? Uh, the context of the book, the timing, and this uh, special interest for agriculture. And uh, for the general audience, uh, could you tell us the difference between uh, agriculturals and the other type of commodities in terms of uh, market dynamics, in terms of cycles, and any other parameters that you deem important? Okay, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I think that Morocco is a vi vibrant country, and OCP is a major uh, element in the portfolio of assets of the country and the RCP Policy Center in particular. So uh, kindly you mentioned that my first book uh, was a reference and interestingly, not only in trading rooms and so forth, but also when there are court cases, litigation between two parties in a court in London or the US, what is written in the book is perceived as the reference to which the judge is going to refer himself in order to, to make his judgment. So agricultural finance is my latest book. I had uh, two others in between, but it doesn't matter. Uh, agriculture, in fact, is very dear to my heart. And I started building an expertise in the field because I was hired by Louis Dreyfus in 1999 to work full-time at EDF Trading in London, which was a joint venture with Electricité de France. Interestingly, despite the fact that my passport, first one, very dear to me, is French, I was not hired by Electricité de France, but at Louis Dreyfus. I worked there on electricity derivatives, natural gas, crude oil, coal, and after that, the, I decided I like to move on, and as of, as of 2001, 2002, I worked for Louis Dreyfus in the US on grains, uh, cereals, coffee, cocoa. So for a long time have been have I been interested in agriculture. However, in my previous book, I decided to cover the big spectrum of commodities because uh, I wanted to put everything I would have liked to find myself when I started commodities on my own in 1995, coming from the field of mathematical finance applied to interest rates and equities. 
So I had already agriculture in my mind, but I started with the different uh, view of the sub-commodity classes called metals, energy, and agriculture. In the meantime, two things happened as of 2006. Firstly, the world understood that uh, cereals were not necessary at all times in quantities which were enough to feed the planet. So suddenly, the message feed the planet became uh, very uh, visible, repeated everywhere. In my own case, I had the opportunity to work for other companies called Bungi, which is a company based between the US, Brazil, and Switzerland, and other food companies. So that's for the scientific part. For the real life part, uh, I believe that, and I was happy to be a little bit ahead of time, I moved from probability to finance before many of my friends, and I moved from mathematical finance to commodities before many of my friends, and today I have been very focused on agriculture before many other people because I like human beings. That's the first reason of my long visit to Morocco. Usually I go here and there for one day, two days. I invested for and four days and a half. I like Africa. I believe that it is a beautiful continent. It is not from today. It has been going on for decades. I have been dreaming of building a finance institute for young ladies in Africa. So that's my theme. And I believe that, like many people, that Africa is a continent of today and tomorrow, but should not be the continent of today and tomorrow for those who want take everything and go, but should be the continent for those who come and build. So agricultural finance tries to explain the crops, the harvest, but also the importance of land, the fact that land should primarily belong to the citizens of the country, of the continent. I am interested always in energy, I am interested in water. I am interested in infrastructure. And that's why the second title of my book is From Crops to Land, Water, and Infrastructure. OK, uh, before we start talking about uh, Africa, I'd like to divert uh, to, uh, to the financial markets and uh, to the financial institutions and precisely to trading. Uh, we've seen recently that uh, financial institutions are divesting uh, from commodity trading uh, into other uh, asset classes or other activities. Uh, what can one learn from this? Uh, are these asset classes losing momentum or is it just a temporary setback? Okay, if I may say, it's neither of the two, to my modest view, and without being insulting, banks never invested time and effort to understand that commodities are different from pieces of paper called bonds and stocks. So you cannot just go to commodities and decide that you are the golden boy trader of options on stocks, and this is going to help you when you go to corn, to cereals, to fertilizers. And to me, without being unpleasant, the fact that banks are going away is the proof, if anything, they, that they did not succeed in commodities. The financial markets today, as you know, are not so safe. Interest rates are close to zero. Uh, instruments related to interest rates are not very rewarding. Uh, the stock markets are very difficult to predict. Consequently, if banks had learned how to play the commodity markets, 
they would have stayed. They left because they never learned how to do it and they gave up. Um, speaking of indicators, you've mentioned many indicators. Uh, in the context of Africa and in the context of the African economy, uh, what in your opinion are the uh, most relevant, accurate uh, indicators uh, that governments or other stakeholders should be looking at uh, when assessing the health of the African economy? You mean global economic indicators or whatever? Uh, I, there are many criteria that uh, one uh, can uh, identify in order to measure uh, the value of Africa to the world at this moment. I don't know whether these indicators are published, but one indicator could be the number of foreign countries, companies, which are now established in Africa, uh, uh, the amount of money which is invested in Africa, the number of human beings coming from other countries who are working in Africa not to take the money and run, but to build. Okay? So there are a number of indicators. Each of them would not give the whole picture, but all of them are quite instructive. The number of publications, obviously not only the World Bank, the IMF, and so on, but other publications, other books, and so forth, documents which are dedicated to Africa and which take efforts on the part of the authors. Uh, still in regard to Africa, um, we know that the continent is uh, resource rich and we know that the continent needs a lot of uh, investing, a lot of financing uh, to secure and sustain its growth and development. But we also know that uh, the uh, global economy uh, has, uh, has gone through uh, a painful episode in 2008 and uh, is uh, still slowly recovering. And we also know that uh, many other many, uh, fi financial, financial assets or asset classes uh, are depressed, commodities, commodities are depressed. Uh, in this context, uh, where do you think that Africa can find the necessary money to grow? And this is the first part of my question. And uh, in the African context, do you think that the uh, financial market and uh, financial instruments uh, are relevant and uh, credible alternative source of financing? Okay, so let me first focus on your first question. Firstly, some famous economists uh, have written about the so-called curse of commodities. You own a commodity which gives you a lot of money, let's say crude oil, Eventually, you make lots of money. The government or other entities become corrupt and the small people are suffering more than ever. And this has been observed not only in countries like Nigeria, for instance, but this has been observed in a developed economy called the Netherlands, which some decades ago had a gigantic amount of natural gas and the result was terrible for, for the uh, Dutch economy and for the Dutch population. So message number one, commodities are neither a necessary condition nor a sufficient one for the welfare of the citizens of a country. I will take another example, a country with which Morocco has very strong ties, which is called Ethiopia. Ethiopia has essentially nothing, and for a number of years, Ethiopia has developed its agricultural production and has amazingly moved up in terms of uh, uh, um, uh, net gross product for human being and so on. So it is not because Ethiopia does not have mines like Gabon, Tanzania, whatever. Ethiopia has no crude oil like Nigeria. Ethiopia has been doing very well. And the problem of Ethiopia today is not the depressed cycle in the commodities. The problem is a weather event called El Nino, which is creating a drought in Ethiopia and destroying a big part of the agricultural output. 
So consequently, commodities is a very large field, and it is a very complicated subject, and many people say many things, and one needs to be extremely precise. Okay, so my claim is that at all times, one can be successful and useful for the population in the world of commodities when you take an activity that I call transformation. You take the rock, the phosphate rock, and you transform it into DAP. This differential is a positive number that you can generate for your citizens. When you take iron ore and you make steel, it is a transformation activity which is positive for your citizen. So I believe that during depressed cycles of commodities, one can still, on one hand, generate income, on the other hand, take time to breathe and make decisions, understand and keep going. The second que question about the financial instruments, I believe that the financial instruments may be useful as long as we look at them carefully and we ob observe that they are useful. In particular, there is a product I like a lot that we call commodity linked bonds. I am a country, my name is Ghana, uh, or Ivory Coast. I produce cocoa and I need money. I issue bonds and the bond buyer, the investor, will be rewarded for the accrued interest every year with a formula related to the spot price of cocoa. The price goes up, the Ghana government pays more, but it generates more money in the market of cocoa, and conversely. So my point is to say, you, we are not going to search for all kinds of financial instruments, which may be eventually negative for the country, because whoever is trying to convince you to buy this financial instrument has firstly his or her benefit in mind, okay? So I don't believe that they are going to save us. Some will, the others will push us into the abyss. Um, when we speak about commodities, uh, we do have to uh, have a note about the outlook for 2016. How do you see the outlook of commodities uh, for this uh, current year? Okay, for 2016, Okay, same thing, and without being too boring and didactic, we talk, the bankers talk about commodities. We know that we have three subclasses which behave differently. Energy is different from metals, different from agriculture, and we know that within a class, we have each commodity which has its own life. In 2015, 2016, copper has gone down, iron ore has gone down, gold has gone up. All the three are metals. They don't behave in the same way. If you look at agricultural commodities, it is the same thing. If you look at uh, coal and uh, crude oil, they don't necessarily move in the same manner at all times. So basically, I agree that in a global manner, commodities are in a depressed uh, cycle because the world economy is not too great. The central bankers have been downloading enormous quantities of money in the market and maybe the history will write that this may not have been optimal. That's where we are. Okay. Um, I would like to conclude the, this uh, interview uh, with prospects and challenges. 
And uh, given your large experience, expertise and knowledge about agricultural and commodities in general, uh, I'd like to know your, your insights uh, on the opportunities and challenges facing, say, countries like Morocco uh, or the African continent in general for, um, say, the next 10 years. And more importantly, I, I would like your recommendations, the kind of recommendations that you would give to, uh, to a country or to the continent as to how to, uh, how to face and overcome these uh, potential future uh, challenges and threats. Okay, so I will say a few things. My first recommendation will not be for the countries, but for uh, the uh, agents, the economic agents, who want to come to this continent. Please come only if you want to help. If you don't want to help, just go. Go somewhere else. This continent needs help. That's the first message, and I really mean it with the depth of my heart. Second message, I believe that Africa has a vibrant future. I am myself personally invested from a financial standpoint and from the value of my time is in a small hydroelectricity project in West Kenya because when we don't have electricity, which is obviously not the case of Morocco, human beings do not live like we should live in 2016. So we have to make progress. Energy is essentially in the picture. Now, coming to Morocco, and not to be flattering, I believe, and I read in many places, that Morocco is, has the natural place to be a leader. A leader not to dominate, a leader to give a hand to the others to come up. Morocco is very close to Europe. Morocco is directly open to the two Americas, one in which I live, the other that I visit when I go to mining companies. So from geography, Morocco has a crucial position. From a human development, Morocco is very far ahead, and the human beings are just remarkable. I won't mention an anecdote which happened to me last night when I was walking randomly in the streets of Rabat, but I will write it somewhere. So what is my modest message? The continent will move forward. We need to think about feeding the planet and feeding Africa, firstly, because there will be necessarily more, more human beings and not more land. Hence, we need to increase the production per hectare. We need irrigation. We need fertilizers. It goes clearly in that direction. And we need one, two countries which are going in a friendly way to give a hand to the other countries helping on the agricultural side, helping on the financial side, because uh, Casablanca is becoming the financial, a financial city. So basically, my view, and again, I do not want to be unpleasant to the other countries. To me, uh, Africa somehow is driven by two extreme countries in terms of position, Morocco, and South Africa. South Africa has the luck, the, the virtue of uh, benefiting from decades of other populations which did good things and bad things. At least they helped the local economy to grow. It is not clear that in Northern Africa, those who came in the 50s and so on did the best for Tunisia, Morocco, Algeria. And today, however, these countries are moving ahead and Morocco and a remarkable company called OCP, which is uh, uh, a beautiful image for Morocco, are there to move forward and to help the others move forward. And the message is human capital. Take your human capital, move your human capital, and the fact that, that I am here for four days to explain 
every single piece of what I think I have understood in the financial markets and commodity markets is the proof that Morocco and OCP and OCP Policy Center are aware of the development of human capital in this country, in this continent. Professor, thank you very much indeed for accepting our invitation. It was a real honor to have you and we look forward to welcome you in other occasions. I am coming back.